Welcome to Bond University on iTunes U. Uh, last night, uh, John Williams reminded me of a question that he had put to me some years ago. The question was, what is the collective noun that you apply to a group or gathering of solicitors general? I replied, a slurry of solicitors general. <laughs> now, in case there are some of you who don't know, a slurry is a malodorous form of liquid manure. <laughs> now, I've heard a lot this morning about uh, how solicitors general get together, commonwealth and state. I must say it was very different in my day. We didn't have meetings of solicitors general and indeed the view taken by the people I worked with in Canberra was that the states were represented by a horde of uncivilised barbarians. The only civilised thinking emanated from Canberra itself. The only occasion on which I can recall cooperating with these uncivilised hordes from uh, regional Australia was in the Quickest Air Section 92 case, which was <coughs> heard by the Privy Council in, I think, about 1967. It was a case which involved a challenge to the validity of the road tax legislation, Commonwealth and State. And uh, we made common cause in that case. Uh, and I found it quite agreeable working with the State Solicitors General, uh, rather more agreeable than opposing them in court. And at the end of one of our working sessions in London, it was suggested by somebody, I've forgotten whom, uh, that we should have dinner at the Savoy Grill. So we went down to the Savoy Grill, a horde of about 20 of us carrying our working gear and cases, uh, and we were offered a table. Uh, somebody, I've forgotten who it was, ordered the house red wine. Uh, a carafe was brought. It was pronounced off by Michael Helchin, who was Harold Snellings, Jr., representing New South Wales. So we sent it back. Uh, a carafe was returned, handed to Helchin, who again said it was off, and then he passed it to me for confirmation. It definitely was off, so it was sent back. Finally, the third carafe was okay. But clearly enough, they had thought back there in the kitchen or wherever it was, these people are a bunch of colonials. They won't recognise that it's off, and even if they do, they won't have the nerve to send it back a second time. <laughs> but we did. Uh, now, on, I suffered on that occasion because I made the mistake of asking the waiter what dish he would recommend as a main course from the menu. And his reply in impeccable English was, the lamb, it's the cheapest. <laughs> now, uh, New South Wales was then represented by Harold Snelling, as I've said. Uh, Harold Snelling was the very embodiment of a solicitor general, uh, a man of large build, uh, portentous voice and portentous appearance. Uh, he embodied that image of authority and dignity that you come to expect in a Solicitor General, although I notice all my colleagues here don't seem to have that build or image. Um, but he certainly had it, and I felt by comparison something of a smart aleck, uh, an expression I used because my wife, when she first met me, was asked by her employer what she thought of me, and she said, I think he's a smart aleck. And when I questioned her about this only recently, she said she still holds firmly to that view. <laughs> now, despite the rather all-embracing title of this uh, lecture or paper I'm delivering, I, in fact, propose to concentrate on uh, a relatively confined topic. And that topic... Uh, arises because the organisers of the conference, including Professor Williams, 
supplied me with a sheaf of papers that centred on Sir Maurice Byers' controversial claim and that of 11 other public servants uh, to refuse to answer questions in the Commonwealth Senate relating to the notorious 1975 loan agreement. Uh, in the event, the Senate excused Sir Morris from further attendance, but referred the matter to the Committee of Privileges, which delivered a report. The central thrust of this paper uh, is to deal with the buyer's claim, and incidentally, that of the 11 senior public servants. Uh, but before I do so, there is one matter I want to mention that uh, bears on the Solicitor General's relationship with the Parliament. Um, and it includes the fact that when I was Solicitor General, I did, uh, on more than one occasion, advise parliamentary committees on legal questions. I don't actually recollect uh, obtaining an instruction from the Attorney General to do that, and I don't recollect obtaining his consent. In fact, most of the work that I did as Solicitor General, outside appearing in court for the Commonwealth and emanations of the Commonwealth, um, by way of giving advice, for example, came to me directly through the Crown Solicitor or the Attorney General's Department. Uh, I don't myself think the Attorney General was consulted about these matters. It was assumed that this was the sort of work that the Solicitor General would do. And uh, even if it wasn't actually appearing for the Commonwealth itself, it nevertheless was considered to fall within the um, umbrella of his responsibilities. Now, to come to Sir Morris and his engagement with the Senate. Uh, by way of preliminary, I should say that even in court, Sir Morris's submissions at times verged on the mystical. Uh, Mr. Michael McHugh uh, said, before he was appointed to the High Court of Australia, that his greatest difficulty as counsel was in replying to a buyer's argument because you were never sure what that argument was. And Sir Morris's appearance before the Senate on this occasion in 1975 saw him at his mystical best. He certainly baffled his interlocutors, and 35 years later, I am still bemused by what he had to say. Uh, in order to appreciate that, what that was, uh, we need to understand what the Senate wanted from him and the 11 public servants who was summoned to appear. On the 9th of July, 1975, the Senate, then controlled by the opposition, resolved that it was of opinion that the government has failed to give the parliament and the Australian people a proper, full and accurate account of the activities of its ministers, servants and agents relating to all dealings by them, both prior to and subsequent to the Executive Council meeting of 13th December 1974, which authorised the Minister for Minerals and Energy to borrow a sum not exceeding uh, 4,000 million in the currency of the United States for temporary purposes. The Senate went on to resolve that the Solicitor General and the 11 public servants, including the Secretary to the Treasury, be called to the bar of the Senate to answer questions upon these matters and to produce all documents, files or papers in their possession, custody or control relevant to these matters. Uh, summonses were duly served on the Solicitor General and the public servants. The background to the Senate resolution was the opposition case that the proposed borrowings were not for temporary purposes and were illegal, not being authorised by the financial agreement. The opposition relied on an opinion of Mr. William Dean, which stated, it is clear that if the proposed borrowings had not been borrowings for temporary purposes, they would have been in breach of the financial agreement and illegal. 
Mr. R. J. Ellicott and Senator Gre Greenwood, both Queen's Council, gave opinions to the same effect. The contrary view on which the government acted was under understood to be supported by the opin opinion of Senator Murphy, the then Attorney General. It was believed at the time, whether rightly or wrongly, that the Solicitor General considered the Attorney's view was arguable, though the opposition may not have considered this to be his view. And I should say that Sir Morris's view of a question being arguable was a somewhat elastic view. I appeared with him and against him at the bar, and he was well known for taking the view that if he felt he could argue the point in court, it was arguable. <laughs> it was a variation of Sir Garfield Barwick's view of what was arguable. Something that was arguable by them was not always arguable by other people. Well, that's probably accurate. <laughs> uh, now, on the 15th of July 1975, the Prime Minister, Mr Whitlam, wrote to the President of the Senate saying that each officer, referring to the 11 public servants, will be instructed by his minister to claim privilege in respect of all questions upon the matters contained in the resolution and in respect of the production of all documents, files and papers relevant to these matters. Prime Minister's letter concluded with this paragraph. I make plain the government's view that what the Senate is seeking to do is to obtain through officers of the public service information and documents which should be sought from ministers by the normal and proper procedures of the Parliament. In taking this course, the fundamental character of ministerial responsibility is challenged. It is the government, not the public service, that will answer in the Parliament any request, any challenge put to it. It is the government, not the public service, that is responsible to the people. This is in accord with the principles on which our democracy is based. If these principles are successfully challenged, government would become unworkable. And ironically, he quoted a statement by Sir Robert Menzies, who had said earlier that it would be alarming if an anti-government Senate could undermine the objectivity and non-political integrity of the public service by exposing its senior and most responsible officers to a parliamentary inquisition from which they had a right to be immune and compelling their entry into the field of political debate. On the same day, the Solicitor General wrote to the President of the Senate, asserting that the Solicitor General stood in a constitutional relationship to the Crown in which he said, under the Constitution, the executive power of the Commonwealth alone is vested. The letter went on to state that the deliberations of the Crown are secret, a reference to the well-known passage of Sir Owen Dixon, in Sir Owen Dixon's judgment in the Communist Party case, and referred to the oath of confidentiality taken by members of the Executive Council. The letter went on to say, that the Crown's claim of privilege extends to opinions of the law officers, whether written or oral, and that the privilege covering such opinions had been recognised by the House of Commons, as indeed it had. The letter concluded with the statement that the author must object to answer any question relating to the resolution or otherwise to claim, otherwise cl the claim to privilege may be to that extent defeated. In the course of responding to questions put to him by senators, the Solicitor General made the basis of his, of his objection to answering questions relating to the matters identified in the resolution somewhat clearer than the case which he presented in his letter to the President. First, he said that the government had made a claim of privilege covering these matters, a claim either made or evidenced by the Prime Minister's letter to the President. It was not a claim of privilege asserted by the Solicitor General himself, though he considered the claim of privilege to have been validly made by the Crown and not waived. Secondly, according to the Solicitor General, in his answer to a question put by Senator Wright, the privilege is the privilege of secrecy of Crown deliberations. That there was a Crown deliberation here seems to be indisputable, 
The question, therefore, is the extent to which the privilege extends. I should have thought it extended to events prior and subsequent to those deliberations. He went on to say, the central constitutional notion is the secrecy of the deliber deliberations. Senator Wright then said, yes, that is behind the privilege of confidentiality, and the Solicitor General assented to that. Now, in passing, I note the Prime Minister in his letter to the President made no mention of secrecy as such. His letter identified the principle of responsible government as the central constitutional principle at stake, but focused on the attempt to obtain information from the public servants rather than from the ministers. The third point made by the Solicitor General was that it was his duty to abide by the government's claim of privilege based on secrecy. Even if the committee or the Senate rejected that claim, he conceived it to be his duty to abide by the claim, though he did speak of it as a matter of conscience. The Senate, after excusing the witnesses, including the Solicitor General from further attendance, resolved that the action of the government in directing public servants called to the bar of the Senate not to answer any questions is a massive cover-up of the government's involvement in the attempted raising of overseas loans. And then it went on to refer to the Committee of Privileges for report a number of matters, including the direction of the Prime Minister and the Ministers to public servants, um, the further direction that notwithstanding any rejection by the Senate of the claim for privilege, the public servants were not to answer any questions, and thirdly, the further claim for privilege made by the Attorney General. The Committee of Privileges delivered a majority and a minority report. I think the balance of power in the Senate having changed in the meantime, holding that there was no breach of parliamentary privilege on the part of anyone. The report stated, with reference to the Solicitor General's claim, this is not a claim of crown, crown privilege. It is a claim which arises from the Solicitor General's conception of his obligation as the second law officer of the Crown in the situation where the Crown has claimed privilege. It is a claim entitled to the respect of the Senate and the Committee and ancillary to the matters of Crown privilege referred to above. The minority, uh, which consisted of Senators Greenwood, Webster and Wright, in a more comprehensive minority report, stated, so far as relevant, the directions of the Australian ministers to claim privilege were misconceived. Such a claim is a claim for a, for a Senate not to require an answer on a document in appropriate cases. The ultimate decision as to whether a question must be answered on a document or a document produced is for the Senate, not for the executive and then with respect to the Solicitor General, that the Solicitor General, not claiming any privilege on professional ground or self-incrimination, was wrong in claiming that he should join a claim for privilege to the Minister's claim of privilege, simply because such a claim was made, and he was an officer appointed by the Executive. He erred in not discharging his higher duty to give evidence before a House of Parliament when lawfully required, subject to all proper privilege in respect of any particular question or class of questions. There are a number of puzzling features of the Myers thesis. First, there is the proposition that the Solicitor General stands in a constitutional relationship with the Crown, a relationship which evidently rests on his status as second law officer of the Commonwealth. Why that status gives rise to a constitutional relationship and what that relationship entails was not explained. Perhaps the suggested relationship is tied to section 61 of the Constitution, which confers the executive power of the Commonwealth, but in what way remains a matter of surmise. No doubt the Solicitor General stands in a different position from the 11 public servants but it's not clear why it should make a difference between his obligation to answer questions and their obligation to answer questions. Law officers' opinions and advices to the Crown have been traditionally privileged from production to a House of Parliament. 
While this privilege distinguishes the law officer, officers, perhaps from other government advices, the privilege does not evidence a constitutional relationship apart from the existence of the privilege itself. Quite apart from the Solicitor General's status as a law officer, Sir Morris was right in maintaining to S Senator Greenwood that he was an independent officer who was not amenable to instructions from government or the Attorney General as to how he should discharge his statutory responsibilities or as a witness summoned by the Senate. Secondly, there is the proposition that the deliberations of the Crown are secret. So they are, unless they are made public. Is the proposition any more than a statement of fact? The answer to this question depends upon what Sir Owen Dixon meant by his enigmatic comment in the Communist Party case. If it was the obligation of the Solicitor General to keep the relevant deliberations secret, it was also the obligation of the 11 public servants to keep the deliberations secret. A ministerial instruction was not necessary to bring this about. Indeed, the purpose of the ministerial instructions seems to have been to trigger an obligation of secrecy, but to, not to trigger that, but to reinforce the constitutional principle of responsible government, which was the central point of Mr Whitlam's letter to the President. The final element in the bias thesis, which is problematic, is the distinction which he made in answer to questions put by Senator Greenwood between the rejection of a claim to privilege by a court and the rejection of such a claim by the Senate or a House of Parliament. Sir Morris made it clear that in the case of rejection by a court, the answers would have to be given and the documents produced. He did not offer a reason for the difference in outcome. The critical question raised by Sir Morris's claim is whether the confidentiality of Crown deliberations protects them from disclosure, either to a court in litigation or to a House of Parliament which seeks to inquire into them. As I've said, Sir Morris seems to have acknowledged to Senator Greenwood that if a court rejected a claim to privilege, questions must be answered and documents produced. If this be so, why should the position be different if the Senate, rather than a court, rejects the claim? It seems to me that the only basis for plausibly differentiating the two situations is the principle of ministerial responsibility invoked by Mr Whitlam in his letter to the President, supported by the statement of Sir Robert Menzies, and by the majority judgments of Chief Justice Spiegelman and Justice Ma in the New South Wales Court of Appeal decision Egan and Chadwick. This case was a sequel to Egan and Willis, a High Court decision, in which Egan, the Minister of the Crown and Treasurer, a member of the Legislative Council of New South Wales and leader of the government in that house, had refused to table pa papers called for by a resolution of the House. The House passed a resolution judging him guilty of contempt and suspending him from the services of the House for the remainder of the day's sittings. The High Court held that a House of the New South Wales Parliament had such power to suspend a member of the House who refuses to produce a non-privileged document called for by the House. In that case, Egan had made no claim for privilege in relation to the documents called for. Subsequently, uh, he made a claim for privilege following resolutions of the House passed on the 13th of October 1998 and uh, again, he refused to table documents. On the 24th of November 1998, by a further rev resolution, the Council called on Egan to table further documents involving an evaluation and report by an independent legal ar arbiter if there was a claim of legal professional privilege or public interest immunity. 
Egan delivered documents in his possession called for by the resolution, except two documents in respect of which he claimed legal professional privilege or public interest immunity. These documents he refused to take. Again, he was adjudged guilty of contempt of the House and suspended from the service of the House. He was escorted from the House by the Usher of the Black Rod, who was directed by counsel's resolution to remove Egan from the House. Egan then commenced legal proceedings. In his statement of claim, he alleged that his forcible removal from the House constituted an assault by the Usher of the Black Rod. In the proceedings which followed, the filing of the statement of claim, two issues arose for determination. One, did the power of the council to acquire production of documents upheld by the High Court in Egan and Willis include power to require production of privileged documents of the two classes already mentioned? And if not, two, who was to decide whether the claim of privilege in relation to any class of document should be allowed? The majority, Chief Justice Spiegelman and Justice Ma held that the Council had power to require production of documents subject to either one of the two classes of privilege mentioned, but that the Council had no power to require production of documents, production of which would be inconsistent with the doctrine of ministerial responsibility, such as cabinet documents. Justice Priestley dissented, holding that the power extended to such documents. The court did not answer the second question. The judgment of Chief Justice Spiegelman, with whom Justice Maher agreed, stated five propositions which are incontrovertible. One, each house exercises a constitutional function to make laws. Two, each house performs the function of parliamentary review of executive conduct in accordance with the principle of responsible government. Three, the Council has such powers as are reasonably necessary for the proper exercise of its functions. Four, production of documents by ministers is reasonably necessary for the proper exercise of both its functions. Each House may impose sanctions on a member of the House for the purpose of inducing compliance by a member, but not for the purpose of punishing a member. It is said that the role of the Council in reviewing executive conflict is derived from the doctrine of responsible government. Chief Justice Gleeson described the concept of responsible government in Egan and Willis as a concept based upon a combination of law, convention and political practice. The way in which that concept manifests itself is not immutable. The concept is, of course, fundamental to our system of government. Indeed, along with representative government, it is the central theme in that system. Ministerial responsibility to Parliament is one of the elements of responsible government. This responsibility is owed by a minister to both Houses of Parliament, but in particular to the House of which he is a member. The responsibility has individual and collective elements. Spiegelman's conclusion rests on two paragraphs in his judgment. Paragraph 54. The high constitutional function of the Legislative Council encompass both legislating and the enforcement of the accountability of the executive. Performance of these functions may require access to information, the disclosure of which may harm the public interest. Access to such information may accordingly be reasonably necessary for the performance of the functions of the Council. 55. However, in my opinion, it's not reasonably necessary for the proper exercise of the functions of the Legislative Council to call for documents the production of which would conflict with the doctrine of ministerial responsibility, either in its individual or collective dimension. The power is itself in significant degree derived from that doctrine. The existence of an inconsistency or conflict constitutes a qualification on the power itself. The Chief Justice went on to note that in the context of claims for public immunity, in the course of litigation, the courts have always recognised the significance of cabinet confidentiality as an application of the principle of collective responsibility. Now, in his dissenting judgment, uh, Justice Priestley relied very heavily on the judgment of the High Court, the unanimous judgment of the High Court in the Commonwealth and the Northern Lands Council case. He made the obvious point 
that the case for the existence of the power in the council was stronger than the case for the existence of the power in the courts. When regard is had to the constitutional role of the council in reviewing executive action and holding the executive ac accountable, this must be so. Uh, Justice Priestley noted as a counterweight to the view of Sir Robert Menzies that Senator Gareth Evans had expressed the view that uh, a House of the Parliament had power to require the production of documents um, in circumstances where such a claim for privilege uh, would have been made. Now to come to Commonwealth and Northern Land Council. Uh, that case is authority for the proposition that uh, the courts can insist on the production uh, of documents notwithstanding the existence of the claim that is made. There the court pointed out that though there are extremely strong considerations of public policy weighing against documents recording cabinet deliberations upon current or controversial matters, the immunity is not absolute. The court said, <coughs> in the case of documents recording the actual deliberations of cabinet, <coughs> only considerations which are indeed exceptional would be sufficient to overcome the public interest in their immunity from disclosure, they being documents with a preeminent claim to confidentiality. Uh, and the court went on to expound on that theme. The passages which I refer to in the draft paper clearly acknowledge the existence of a power in the courts to order production of documents recording cabinet deliberations, though they state that the power will be exercised only in exceptional circumstances. The majority in Egan and Chadwick did not refer to these passages. The majority judgments proceed on the footing that these passages did not exist. On the other hand, Lord Just, uh, Justice Priestley relied on these passages. The key to the majority conclusion <clears throat> that there is no such power is expressed in the last two sentences of paragraph 55 of Chief Justice Spiegelman's judgment. They present the proposition that because the power is in sig significant degree derived from the doctrine of ministerial responsibility, <coughs> excuse me, the existence of an inconsistency between the power and the doctrine constitutes a qualification of the power. Now, subject to section 49 of the Australian Constitution, uh, it may be accepted that the power of a house to order production of documents is related to the doctrine of ministerial responsibility. But a distinction needs to be drawn between the House's legislative function and its accountability function. There doesn't seem to be any intrusion into the doctrine of ministerial responsibility if power is acknowledged to exist in the case of a call for documents in aid of the exercise of the legislative power. And if the power exists in that respect, it seems difficult to say that it should be qualified in relation to the second aspect, uh, aspect that is, of accountability. Um, and in connection with that view, uh, one needs to refer to the judgment of Justice Gordon, Justice Gummo, and Justice Hayne in Egan and Willis, where uh, emphasis lay upon the importance of the doctrine of ministerial, uh, at least of responsible government, uh, in connection with a House's power to review uh, the actions and activities of the executive. Uh, and the statement that cabinet confidentiality reflects the principle of collective responsibility means no more than that confidentiality is an important incident of and conducive to collective responsibility in promoting and maintaining full and frank deliberations in Cabinet. To say, as the majority said in Egan and Chadwick, that this element of ministerial responsibility is to prevail over the role of a House in securing accountability of government is to invert the true order of constitutional priorities and the right of the public to be fully informed about the activities of government, particularly in a case where it is alleged that criminality has occurred. 
Curiously enough, Chief Justice Spiegelman referred to a much earlier statement by Lord Chancellor Haldane on responsible government in which he said that the executive, and I quote, is almost the creature of the legislature. Uh, of course, the, today, there are those who would say the executive dominates the legislature, but there's no point uh, in strengthening the executive uh, against the legislature by denying the existence of the power that was in question in Egan and Willis. Uh, now, uh, the paper concludes with some discussion of section 49, um, and in that respect, um, I've drawn heavily on an article of Professor Lynn Dells, which is published in uh, the Melbourne University Law Review in 1993. But in that article, Professor Lindell points out that historically in England, uh, the Houses of Parliament did possess um, a wide ranging power. Indeed, Justice Coleridge in Howard and Gossett described um, the House as the general inquisitors of the realm. Uh, it's difficult to see how, when that power existed, before the theoretical recognition of the doctrine of responsible government, that the power in some way was attenuated in later years by the acceptance uh, of that important doctrine. So the conclusion I reach is that the buyer's thesis is unfounded, as indeed is the claim based to refuse to answer and produce documents uh, insofar as it is based on the doctrine of ministerial, ministerial responsibility. And it follows that I conclude that the majority judgment in Egan and Chadwick is wrong and the dissenting judgment of Justice Priestley is to be preferred. When I was appointed Solicitor General, it happened something like this. We knew there was an imminent retirement on the Supreme Court of South Australia. We knew that the then sitting Solicitor General was a Monty for the job. Up and down Goodger Street, and you'll all know Goodger Street in Adelaide, those of you that have visited it, the cafes and the restaurants were alive with a normal scuttlebutt as to, well, who would replace Caracas. I didn't write a mention. My day-to-day -day work was sex, drugs and violence, which I understood. <laughs> I was called to the Attorney General's office one Tuesday afternoon and Justice Caracas was sitting there and he had a grin on his face like a Cheshire cat. But those of you who know him will know that that means nothing because he always has a grin on his face <laughs> like a Cheshire cat. The attorney walked in, he was late, it's customarily late. He pointed to Caracas and he said, Thursday morning at 11.30, the conclusion of Executive Council, you'll be Justice Caracas. I thought, oh, well and good, that's no surprise. He pointed to me and he said, you'll be Solicitor General. And that's how it occurred. Thursday morning, 11.30, Justice Caracas, put the lid on his pen and he walked out and I walked in. I walked in and suddenly discovered that the mystery of the Constitution is harder, far harder to fathom than sex, drugs and violence. So I had no introduction and no real idea what the function of the Solicitor General was. I'm very grateful to Justice Tate for mentioning the K generation case. It was a baptism of fire. It was a cable case. I've since become, the Honourable Mr Mason will be pleased to know, a member of that very select group that's come to grief <laughs> upon the application of a cable doctrine. But the South Australian Solicitor General Act was enacted in 1972. Before that time, we did not have a Solicitor General. We toyed with the idea, as Mr Mason says, for 10 days in 1858. 
it led to a huge furor in the House of Parliament with the result that there was a, a, a motion of no confidence move and the then government was voted out. And that was the end of the Solicitor General, the only one before 1969. 1969, it was an administrative move. 1972, we have the Act. Section 6, as Rob Meadows has alluded to, of the South Australian Act, follows the 1951 Victorian Act. It provide, provided me with no greater guidance as to what was expected of me. It says, the Solicitor General shall, at the request of the Attorney General, act as Her Majesty's counsel and perform such other duties as are ordinarily performed by counsel and shall not accept, with the consent of the Attorney General, engage in any other remunerative employment. But why, if all I am is retained counsel, acting upon the instructions of the attorney, doing the sorts of things that counsel are expected to do, and such uh, uh, that counsel are expected to do, and only permitted to engage in any form of private practice with the permission of the attorney, why am I the second law officer of the state? In the paper that you have, I suggest that we are the second law officer of the state in those jurisdictions similar to mine where we are retained counsel by virtue of the special relationship that we share with the Attorney General. There is no doubt the Attorney General is obviously the first law officer of the state. In appointing, sorry, in his speech on the second reading of the Solicitor General Bill, South Australia's then Attorney General, later Chief Justice King, didn't refer to the Solicitor General as the second law officer. He referred to him simply in the terms as him or her I should be taken to mean, as senior legal advisor to the Crown. Perhaps that was in the knowledge that the position was different to that in the United Kingdom. And we've been through that this morning. The Solicitor General was not a member of Parliament. The Solicitor General had no powers to act in the place of the Attorney General upon his vacating the office or his being unable to exercise his powers. It was in the case of the Queen and John Wilkes where the Chief Justice of the Court of Common Pleas described the Solicitor General as secundarius atonatus on account of the fact that the courts took judicial notice of him as being the primary law officer when the first law officer could not act or the position was vacant. But of course, that is not the position in South Australia. There is no power vested in the Solicitor General to act upon the position of the Attorney General being vacated or the attorney being unable. The position in South Australia stands in stark contrast to that in New South Wales. So again, looking to history, it would seem to suggest that we are not the second law officer of the state. However, in the paper I suggest that there is a very real sense in which we are, and that is the practical effect of being the primary legal advisor to the government, the primary legal advisor to the Attorney General. And it is suggested that we are the second law officer in that practical sense because of the special relationship with the Attorney General and the role of the Attorney General. But before I turn to discuss those two things, can I just outline quickly what the day-to-day -day role of the Solicitor General in South Australia is? And as Section 6 indicates, uh, the primary function is to act as counsel in all range of matters in which the government becomes involved. And as has been said, that is primarily all civil matters of importance to the government. There is a large component of advice work also undertaken by the Solicitor General. Similar to the experience of Sir Anthony, a lot of my work will come direct from the Crown Solicitor. A lot of it will come without the 
Attorney General having any idea that it's come to me, but on the understanding that that is uh, the, the appropriate approach on the basis that it's the sort of material or the sort of case in which the Solicitor General should be involved. In South Australia, there is also that standing arrangement with the Director of Public Prosecutions. Uh, a very strong relationship has existed with that office for many years, hence you find my predecessors such as Chief Justice Doyle appearing in the High Court in the Fennig matter, similar fact evidence, uh, Brad Selway in the Lipaha matter, which was the ambit of the conspiracy offence, and Justice Crackers perhaps more recently in the HML matter. In the paper, in looking at the role of the Solicitor General, I mention the power to intervene both at the state level and under Section 78B. We have in our Crown Proceedings Act, uh, Section 9, that permits or, or gives the Attorney General the right to intervene in any proceeding in a state court, uh, generally speaking, where there is an issue of uh, uh, public interest at its broadest. It's a, it's a bit more confined, but that, but that will do for now. Uh, that reflects, in my submission, <laughs> that reflects, uh, I suggest, the position of the Attorney General and his role. His role in South Australia is that of primary legal advisor to government and responsible for all government litigation. Now that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound initially to be a strange proposition. It's distinguishable from the position in England where of course the power of the law officers is divided between Attorney General, Home Secretary and Lord Chancellor. So where you have a, an Attorney General who holds that position, primary legal advisor, responsible for all litigation in which the government is embroiled, then the relevance of the Solicitor General's role by virtue of Section 6 begins to take some shape. If he is the minister or she is the minister responsible for those things, then it stands to reason that in the legislation linking the position of the Solicitor General to the Attorney General, that the Attorney, sorry, that the Solicitor General, the Solicitor General's roles and functions should largely mirror the Attorney General's responsibilities. So the content, the nature of the role of the Solicitor General then takes its form and content from that of the Attorney General's first law officer. It's then important, as I say, to understand that role as first law officer. And at page seven, I rely upon another former Solicitor General for South Australia, the late Justice Selway, who explains the enhanced role of an Australian Attorney General in the following terms. The enhanced role became significantly more marked with responsible government. In contrast with the position in England, the move to responsible government in the Australian colonies did result in the centralisation of legal services under the control of the respective colonial Attorney General. There were probably a number of reasons for this, Justice Selway tells us. They included that governments were smaller and centralisation was easier, that colonial attorneys general were adequately paid and that colonial attorneys general usually had the support of competent professional lawyers such as the Solicitor General. Ultimately, the Attorney General was responsible for and had control of the legal services not only to the monarch, as the English equivalent had, but to all government departments. Justice Selway describes the role of the Attorney General as being the ultimate instructor of legal work for government. And again, we see that reflected in Section 78B and in Section 9 of the Crown Proceedings Act in South Australia. The power of the position of the Attorney General in Australia, of course, is contributed to by virtue of the fact that they occupy a position in Cabinet. 
and further it is contributed to by the convention that dictates that the Attorney General be informed about any and all proceedings concerning the government. Now a number of consequences flow from that. First, the Attorney General arguably is less independent of government in the exercise of their responsibilities by, as First Law Officer. There is a greater role for Cabinet. I don't propose to debate that here. Second, unlike their English equivalent, the Attorney General has far greater capacity to protect the rule of law and that will become important and is important in my uh, thesis as to the role of the Solicitor General. Third, by virtue of having that responsibility across government, uh, they have a capacity to enforce and ensure compliance with the rule of law at that general level. Uh, fourth, the Attorney General also bears responsibility as a member of Cabinet of ensuring uh, that Cabinet colleagues are advised fully of the consequences of their decisions on the rule of law. Now it is obvious that the executive is subject to the rule of law and so it falls to those providing advice to government then to ensure that the executive is fully aware of what their responsibilities are. The primary person responsible for that is the first law officer. Then it is also suggested by Justice Selway and others that the rule of law at the government level is something more expansive than what we understand it to be in terms of an assumption upon which the Constitution is built. The assumption upon which the Constitution is built is, built, is that there shall be uh, the three arms of government one makes, one enforces, the other declares, all subject to the law. But Justice Selway says when it comes to practising government, this notion of the rule of law is more expansive. It is perhaps... Uh, sorry. He explains, and at page 8 I set out again another quotation from him. Yet another difference, he says relates to the power and capacity of the Attorney General in the Australian states as a member of his or her cabinet to provide advice on and warn his or her cabinet colleagues of broad issues relating to the rule of law, such as human rights issues. There are basic ethical principles that underlie any liberal democratic government, principles such as honesty and integrity, care and diligence, legality, respect and courtesy, selflessness and confidentiality. Under the Australian constitutional system, these basic ethical principles are not enforced by the courts through judicial review. They are left to the parliament and the executive to protect and enforce. So for Selway, this notion of the rule of law it's more expansive, no, is a more expansive notion when it comes to the practice of government. And it includes ethical principles, as he identified, and I just referred you to. Sir Anthony Mason, sorry, before I say that, he also links them to our system of liberal democracy. And Sir Anthony Mason in that regard has described the concept of modern democracy in the following terms. It goes beyond simple majoritarian government and parliamentary sovereignty. It extends to a new notion of responsible government which respects the fundamental rights and dignity of the individual and calls for the protection of the individual's right against undue interference and intrusion by authority. Justice Finn has suggested that the answer perhaps lies in the notion of government as being a matter of public trust. So what is in the public interest operates as a limiting principle upon the exercise of executive power. Whatever the answer, at a minimum, the ethical principles that underlie a liberal democracy are the stuff of convention. And that convention is one which the public have come to expect the executive to observe. So now I return to the role of the Solicitor General. He or she will have occasion to give advice or make submissions against the understanding of the role 
of the Attorney General. That role, as I have just been through, involves the protection of the rule of law as more broadly understood than the assumption that underpins the Constitution. As all of us, or as many of us in this room, I think will agree, in many areas, the opinion of the Solicitor General will constitute the executive's understanding of the law and what is required in its enforcement. And it's by no means an overstatement to observe that disputes between departments or departments and employees are often resolved upon the opinion or by reference to the opinion of the Solicitor General. Further again, it's not an overstatement to indicate that the attitude of the Attorney General in, to a particular issue in proceedings in which he or she decides to intervene or this government becomes embroiled will reflect the views, attitude or advice of the Solicitor General. So if it is our views, our advice, our attitude that is reflected in these decisions, then we are, in truth, the second law officer. Because by reference to the role of the first law officer, where we step forward to advise, to advise, and we advise against the background of what that role is, we, in, in effect, in practical effect, are the second law officer. But there's a, a important, an important distinction always to be aware of. We may, some may, we may, call ourselves the second law officer, but in truth, we're not a law officer at all. As Stephen said this morning, we're retained counsel. We don't exercise any statutory power, perhaps with the exception of New South Wales and anything delegated. We are not politically accountable, save through the Attorney General. We have no independent powers, again, save we're delegated or in, the, in New South Wales. It is only in that practical sense, I suggest, that we are the second law officers. And in that practical sense, we are extremely powerful and yet at the same time, have no power. I turn then in the paper to the Solicitor General and the Executive Government. In South Australia, ministers do not have direct access to the Solicitor General. I've spoken of the understanding with the Crown Solicitor and the DPP's office. If a minister wishes the opinion of the Solicitor General, they either prevail upon the Crown Solicitor uh, to do so on the basis that they satisfy him or her that it's a matter that warrants it, or uh, they channel their request through the Attorney General. That's an important constraint because it allows the Attorney General control of what is in effect his, his, the incumbent is a he, his role. His role being the primary source of legal advice to government and the, uh, as Justice Selway put it, the ultimate instructor of go for government in legal matters. But then when we get these requests for advice, we now have some idea of what the role of the, the Attorney General is, and we have some idea of what our responsibility is by virtue of our relationship with that role, and we know that that role involves this broader notion of the rule of law and what a liberal democracy requires in the practice of government. We also know that any opinion that leaves our officers is going to carry great weight. In many instances, it will be decisive. It will be the state's position. But what guides us then in terms of advising on the broader notion of the rule of law and the practice of government? I'm not talking about legal principles that resolve a particular issue. But what guides us when we come to advising on the way in which government should be practised? Again, I turn to Justice Selway. He identified honesty and integrity, care and diligence, legality, respect and courtesy, selflessness and confidentiality. Those criteria echo with the duties of counsel generally. Justice Finn identified five core principles. It was the democratic principle. Here it was notions of the public's interest derived from the democratic process that limit or direct government practice. There was also the public servant principle. Officials act for and on behalf of the public. There was the integrity principle. Integrity in the practices and processes of government. There was the open government principle. 
and the accountability principle, that is, accountability to the people. I doubt that those principles come as any surprise, but when I walked into the Solicitor General's office, it was a matter of instinct that kind of caused me to fashion my advice in a certain way, so as perhaps to be consistent without knowing with those principles. Some may say that for quite some time there, the force guided me more than anything else. Clearly these principles apply to all lawyers acting for government and not just the Solicitor General. But of course, they are of particular importance to the Solicitor General for the obvious reason, and that is, as I've said, the weight that will be attached to our opinions. I'll make one further point. The role of the Attorney General is not purely reactive. That being so, it is open to, and in my view incumbent upon, a Solicitor General to advise the Attorney of any errant practice in the practice of government which is contrary to the principles and not just contrary to law as I have identified. Quite obviously, there is potential for advice to be unpalatable. Fortunately, there is that degree of independence that Rob Meadows has referred to and I won't go through. That allows us to provide, as the attorney expects, our best advice, not what the government would like to hear. Now, those ethical principles that guide us may result in advice that is not embraced with equal commitment by the attorney or by cabinet. And there is nothing to compel a government to adopt or adhere as rigidly as we might to those principles. Of course, we have one option, the extreme. And that is when the integrity of our position is so compromised, we resign. One would have hoped that that's uh, something that will that none of us will ever see. But of course the resignation of a Solicitor General may be expected to carry a political consequence. But there's the other side of the coin and a note of warning to us all. We must take care in the provision of our advice not to be too dogmatic, not to, be, not to perhaps inject our own values so much, to be accepting of contrary views because the convention that underpins our role and function, linked to that special relationship with the attorney, can be every bit eroded by our own intransigence, by our own failure to acknowledge that there is an appropriate balance to be struck. I then say something in the paper about the role of the Solicitor General and the judiciary. Clearly, the Solicitor General owes the same duties to court as every other barrister. The relative freedom that the Solicitor General has in advising government as to the practice of government, as I've called it, however, is somewhat more constrained when it comes to appearing in court. When we appear, we act on instructions. Of course, the Crown is also expected to be the model, model litigant. Now, that too can be seen as an expression of those ethical principles. As long ago as 1912, perhaps before, but in 1912, Chief Justice Griffiths described the Crown's approach to litigation as the old-fashioned, traditional and almost instinctive standard of fair play to be observed by the Crown in dealing with subjects which I learned a very long time ago to regard as elementary. Again, you can hear in that uh, echoes of those principles that uh, Justice Selway and Justice Finn identified and to which I've referred. It also requires the conscientious compliance with the procedures designed to minimise cost and delay. The last thing I touch upon in the paper as part of the role of the uh, Solicitor General and its relationship with the executive is the issue of interventions. I first deal at page 14 and 15 with section 9 of the Crown Proceedings Act. What, what is little known about uh, this section 
is that the right that it extends to the Attorney General, it extends to the <coughs> Attorneys General of the other states and of the Commonwealth. I don't think I have ever, or I don't know of any case where any attorney from outside South Australia has turned up and purported to uh, intervene pursuant to Section 9, but the right is there. When it comes to intervening under Section 9, one will note that there is no notice provision as there is under that section or in section 78b. Of course then it is difficult to know when there are matters in courts in South Australia that are of concern. We rely upon relationships, the relationship of the Solicitor General of the Judiciary and the profession, the relationship of the Crown Solicitor, the relationship of the DPP and it is not unusual to receive a letter or a phone call from the court uh, this is a matter in which you should be here. We've, we've adjourned it until such time as you get here. Uh, that then gives you a fair indication of what the decision should be when you advise the attorney as to intervening. Uh, Section 78B and the Constitution uh, brings its own unique issues. I, I was in my crawling stages as a Solicitor General, I'm still the most junior, at least for another month or so. I have got to the toddler stages, but in my crawling stages I describe my job to people, foolishly, as a turf war. A turf war in two respects, to keep the Commonwealth out and to keep the judiciary back. Now in both respects I was wrong. There is of course a question as to power involved in those turf wars and it is ever so tempting every time you get a section 78b to attempt to open up a new front with the Commonwealth. But that again is to, to succumb too readily to, to partisan parochial interests and not to consider the nature of the Federation and its operation. And there are times when it is particularly difficult to explain to an Attorney General how the nature of the Federation is such that in this particular case the interests of South Australia are not uh, considered paramount. We have in place systems and delegations are not unlike Northern Territories that allow us uh, to determine whether we should not intervene without troubling the attorney. Wherever we decide to intervene, the attorney is troubled and specific instructions are obtained from him. I note David Bennett's here in the audience and I quote from a paper that he gave once on the issues uh, that are taken into account by the Commonwealth when it decides whether or not to intervene. They largely, largely are similar to those that are referred to by the state, of course, without the specific concerns of the Commonwealth. I am learning, as I've said, I, I've just entered the toddler stage as a Solicitor General. I am learning that a, the Solicitor General of a state has a real opportunity to play a leading role in the development of, in my case, South Australia's political theory of the Constitution. How it works, how it all fits together, how South Australia, and not just South Australia, but the citizens of South Australia, fit within the overall framework. And I am beginning to learn and understand more and more my role as putting submissions consistent with that theory. It is, as Sir Anthony told me once, a matter of having a plan, a plan that you don't necessarily trot out in one case, but you lay the framework for over a number of cases. I know Justice Selway once, junior Brian Cox, as he as it was, later Justice Cox, when he was Solicitor General for South Australia. And he convinced Brian Cox to put an argument on Section 64 of the Constitution. Forgive me, I don't know the content of it. Justice Cox was howled down. Twenty years later, Justice Selway 
convinced that he was right 20 years ago, returned and put the same argument. Uh, I don't know the outcome, but he was rather confident. The judgment was uh, reserved, but he was rather confident that after 20 years, he had succeeded. Of course, there was a man, a prime example, who had vision, who I think you'll all agree, those of you who work with him, who did have a plan and step it out case by case. I am learning that that is what is required. I think you'll all agree that our role with respect to the Constitution is one of evolution, and I am evolving. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, I think the paper's available, so um, I'll just talk to some aspects of it. I have said at the start that, oh, that um, I feel as if I've been asked to write an unauthorised history of MI5 or MI6 when the whole purpose of those bodies, of course, is that their procedures and operations will never become public knowledge. And uh, there's a sense in which the, um, the dealings between solicitors general and the holders of vice regal offices are rather in the same category. However, let me try and shed at least a little light on this um, subject. Um, and I'll normally talk about the governor in the context of the, of the states, um, um, <coughs> unless there's some particular reason to refer to the Commonwealth situation or the position in the Northern Territory where the titles are different, but where the, the role, I think, remains um, essentially the same. Um, the... Uh, the, uh, as everyone will be aware, that the governor's powers are now found in the Australia Act and no longer in letters patent. They can broadly, I suppose, be divided into three categories, powers exercised under the statute, uh, prerogative powers and the so-called reserve powers. The first two categories of those uh, would normally be exercised with the advice of the Executive Council in the case of statutory powers subject to... Um, I think the New South Wales Interpretation Act provides that that's so unless some contrary intention is expressed in the particular legislation. Um, the question of the reserve powers is a more um, contentious one and uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in, um, in due course. Uh, a question that seems to arise at the beginning of this discussion is whether in the case of a request uh, by a governor for advice from a solicitor general uh, whether the approval of the government is required or perhaps desirable before the advice is given. And I'm really speaking now about those first two categories of um, where the governor is acting under a statutory power or exercising a prerogative power. The, the, the question of the reserve powers does raise um, more difficult questions, and as I say, I'll, I'll just come back to that. Um, well, in a technical sense, I suppose this could be considered um, as, a, as one of statutory construction. Uh, Rob this morning has largely gone through those statutes in the different jurisdictions, um, but just let me just remind people that in New South Wales, the legislation provides that the Solicitor General may act as counsel for Her Majesty and may perform such other duties and functions of counsel as the Attorney General directs. Um, and that's essentially the same in Victoria, Western Australia, Tasmania and the Northern Territory. Uh, on the other hand, in Queensland and South Australia, the provisions essentially say that the Solicitor General is to carry out certain functions including acting as counsel to the Crown, at the request of the Attorney General. It may be that the notion of acting as counsel for Her Majesty embraces the notion of acting, um, uh, acting for the Governor uh, without the direction or without the approval of the Attorney General. Um, query whether in Queensland and South Australia uh, that would be the case. Under the Commonwealth legislation, as Stevens pointed out, the functions are to act as counsel for the to, functions to act as counsel for the crown.
crown in the right of the Commonwealth. Um, I should just interpolate there and say, because there's been some discussion of it this morning, but certainly in, um, in New South Wales, the, um, it's, 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 uh, the, the most matters that would come to the Solicitor General don't come directly from the, um, from the Attorney General. Sometimes, sometimes the Attorney General wants direct advice on matters, but um, otherwise there's a wide variety of matters that would come from uh, government departments and um, agencies, uh, from, uh, from other ministers who I might say don't seem to go through the Attorney General um, in New South Wales, unlike in South Australia. Um, and uh, so that, uh, as I say, that on, on, on occasions the Attorney General would ask directly for advice, but that would be a small component uh, of the uh, of the advice work and of course in the case of um, case of litigation um, however uh, uh, interventions uh, all matters relating to intervention uh, are, are subject to the approval of the attorney general unless they're first instance matters in the courts of other the courts of other states in which case I deal with them alone uh, just on that question of functions that it's been noted already this morning that in Queensland um, there's a right of private practice. I'm just thinking now in relation to dealings with the dealings with the governor, whether one would put it under that heading, perhaps. Um, and that in New South Wales, I think uh, I think this was um, organised by by Keith during his time as Solicitor General. There's what appears to be a right of unremunerated private practice. Um, uh, it's a uh, 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 and um, it's never been clear to me that this was a good thing because it prevents you saying to people across the dinner table, well, I'd love to help, of course, but on this occasion I can't. <laughs> uh, however, um, it, it, it does, of course, allow the act providing legal advice to... Um, it has, in fact, in my case been, as I think it was in Keith's case, quite useful allowing the provision of legal advice to voluntary bodies with which one, which one might be inv involved. Um, in the case of the uh, reserve powers, um, I think there's a, perhaps a general acceptance that um, in terms of a governor or a governor general that the uh, advice of the uh, government of the day is not the only useful or appropriate source of advice um, Sir Anthony's made reference this morning to Sir Morris Byers. Sir Morris, um, uh, in, in November of 1975, um, uh, the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, asked uh, the Prime Minister, Mr Whitlam, whether he could approach Sir Morris uh, as Solicitor-General for legal advice. And um, Mr Whitlam said that that advice could only go through him uh, in the event an opinion in the name of uh, Sir Morris and the Attorney General, Mr Enderby, was provided to the Governor General, but a a as a, um, an unsigned document, its status was never entirely clear at the time. Um, the only other federal um, uh, exercise that I was able to, um, to find a note of was in early 1917, when the Prime Minister, Mr Hughes, raised with the Governor-General, Sir Mungo Ferguson, the question of a dissolution of Parliament, and the Prime Minister agreed that the Attorney-General was entitled to seek an independent legal opinion, other than from the Attorney-General, who was also Mr Hughes. And the Governor-General nominated a number of persons, including the Solicitor-General, Sir Robert Garran, as possible sources of advice, and the Prime Minister uh, seemed to seem to agree with that uh, with that proposition. Uh, and uh, uh, if I just give an example or, or <laughs> an incident at the at the state level, because it it was reported in the press in uh, that in uh, December two thousand and nine, uh, the New South Wales Governor Professor. Mary Bashir um, uh, sought advice from herself in relation to the um, avalanche of um, 
male that had come to Government House asking that she dismiss the government. Um, and this was reported in the press and it was confirmed by Government House that, uh, that she had sought some advice. I won't, of course, say what the nature of the advice was, but you will have perhaps observed that the government ran its full term uh, to, the recent, uh, to the recent election. Um, in New South Wales, the Constitution Act provides, there's a fixed four-year parliamentary term, but the Con and the Constitution Act provides that in certain circumstances, chiefly a passage of a no-confidence motion, uh, that there can be, but other, there can be an election within that four-year period, but the circumstances in which that can occur are, are quite uh, limited. Um, uh, so, um, one question in relation to the reserve powers is whether that sort of advice uh, can, be, can be sought uh, without uh, going through the government of the day. At one time, of course, and one thing that occurred that in November 1975 was that the advice of the then Chief Justice, Sir Garfield Barwick, was, was sought. I think it's probably uh, a general feeling now that um, perhaps because the matter might come before the court at some later stage, that, uh, that the advice of the Chief Justice is, is probably not a good idea for the holder of the vast regal office. So that um, in those circumstances, um, in terms of independent advice, uh, perhaps it would have to be the Solicitor General or some other, some other uh, member of the, of the bar. Uh, but it, it may be that that argument, of course, has less force in relation to the statutory and prerogative powers, but um, it may well be the case that a governor um, doesn't necessarily wish the Attorney General or the Premier uh, to know that he or she's effectively questioning their advice and, and seeking another opinion because um, in relation to a matter that the governor has been asked to, um, to approve, uh, it can be in a sense assumed that that has come forward with the uh, advice of the government as a whole and perhaps even sometimes the Attorney General uh, in particular, that that approval can be validly granted. So that it may be that the governor uh, wants to obtain other advice and wants to obtain it um, confidentially uh, from the government. Now that, uh, these, these raise quite um, difficult questions uh, and I'm not sure that anyone has um, precisely identified the answer, the answer to them. Anne Toomey's written in her book on the New South Wales Constitution that um, the Governor is given access to the Solicitor General to give independent legal advice to the Governor if this is requested. Um, there doesn't seem to be a document to this effect, but um, Anne, of course, was uh, for a long time in the Cabinet Office in, in New South Wales. Uh, and uh, at any rate, she puts that forward in her book. Brad Selway, in relation to this question, uh, wrote that, it's likely that the consent of the Attorney General will need to be obtained before the Solicitor General could advise the Governor. But, he added, the practice in some jurisdictions is now so long standing that such consent would seem to be implied. Um, so both Toomey and Selway therefore seem to suggest that in some jurisdictions there's a standing general approval on the part of the Premier and or the Attorney General for the um, Solicitor General to provide advice to the Governor. But obviously in other jurisdictions, and perhaps even in those first set of jurisdictions, um, there still remains a real question as to, uh, as to how that will operate in practice. Uh, in one Australian jurisdiction, uh, the Solicitor General commonly provides advice to the Governor on the direct request of the Governor or the Governor's official secretary. And when the advice is given in writing, sends a copy to the Attorney General. Um, 
it seemed to be no convention in this jurisdiction that the governor advises the Premier or the Attorney General of his or her intention to request the advice of the Solicitor General before, before doing so. Uh, in another jurisdiction, uh, the Vice-Regal Representative has on occasions sought the advice of the Solicitor General on parliamentary and other questions. In this case, the Solicitor General's not sought the approval of the Executive Government before providing advice, although none of the advisers in question, which I won't mention, but appear to involve any conflict between the interests of the, uh, of the Governor and the Executive. And in that same jurisdiction, the, the Governor is provided with the approval of the Executive Government of a copy of any opinion given by the Solicitor General to the Executive in relation to the powers and the duties of the Government. Um, uh, I've set out in the paper um, a protocol, in a sense, which was proposed by uh, Professor Winterton um, in relation to some of these matters, but in, in which he seems to uh, um, assume that the Solicitor General would play a, a significant role in, in any situation where there was a query by the Vice-Regal representative as to the validity of an action which he or she has been asked to, uh, to take. Um, the paper then deals with a number of um, uh, inconclusive election results where the question of um, um, who should be uh, asked by the vice-regal representative to form a government is raised. It's uh, classically an exercise of the reserve powers. I refer to the South Australian election of March 1968, although I, I, I don't not aware of any involvement in that. It was a tied parliament, essentially. Um, of, of, the, of the then uh, South Australian Solicitor General, Mr Dunstan, was the, was the, uh, prem had been the Premier and the Attorney General and was perhaps uh, capable of uh, dealing with those things himself. The Tasmanian election of May 1989 um, uh, provided some particularly interesting material. Um, it was um, uh, that the numbers were that the May 1989, the Liberal government won 17 seats in the House of Assembly, Labor 13, and the balance was, of power was held by five um, Green independents, so-called at that stage. They didn't quite have the cohesion, I think, that the Greens have now. Um, the, uh, the paper sets out, in a sense, what, what, uh, what happened in a political sense, but just let me deal with the role of the Solicitor General. Uh, the Governor took extensive advice um, from the then Solicitor General, Bill Vale, um, who was described by the Premier as the principal independent legal advisor to the Governor. Um, but uh, the Attorney General complained that he hadn't approved the provision of this advice. Uh, the Governor then returned the Solicitor General's opinions to the Attorney General and then the Attorney General sent them back, conceding that there may be a convention that the Solicitor General can advise the Governor directly on constitutional matters. Not sure what one takes out of that uh, a series of toings and throwings. Um, there's an interesting letter, however, from Mr. Uh, Ramsey, who was at that stage the Secretary of the Department of Justice, to the Attorney General, um, and which I've set out a couple of paragraphs from. Uh, he noted that the Premier had been reported as consulting a variety of constitutional sources and said to the Attorney General, um, you need to consider carefully your position if the Premier is obtaining advice from outside constitutional law experts, and in particular, whether you need to be aware of any advice tendered and the propriety of accepting this advice without reference to your second law officer, the Solicitor General. It's a strong tradition of the government taking the Solicitor General's advice on constitutional issues and where outside advice is sought. That advice is ordinarily sought with the full knowledge of the Solicitor General and the Solicitor General being able to comment on that advice to you. Rather tough letter, I thought, from the uh, 
Secretary of the Department to his minister, um, in effect um, saying that um, the Solicitor General was the, I suppose, the person who really um, ought to be providing advice in this situation and um, the government needed to be careful about going outside that source of advice. Um, as it happens, there was a galaxy of, um, of legal uh, and constitutional talent involved here when um, the governor got, got opinions from Sir Harry Gibbs, from Colin Howard, uh, the existing government got opinions from Tom Hughes, Bob Ellicott, Maurice Byers, and Pat, Pat Lane, Darrell Lum. The Greens got a legal opinion from Jim Crawford, um, who was at that time at Sydney Law School. So there's something for everybody in that range of characters. In the Tasmanian election of March 2010, um, it's public knowledge that, that the Solicitor General, Lou Seeley, provided um, considerable advice to the governor. Uh, we don't otherwise know a great deal about what, we don't know anything about what the advice was, unlike 1989, where a lot of that material has since become, since become public. Um, in the federal election of August 2010, another uh, almost tied parliament, but the um, the Governor General didn't, uh, wasn't called on to play any role in relation, any significant role in relation to the formation of the government. But as most people will be aware, there was a question raised about uh, uh, the role of the Governor General in circumstances where her son-in-law was going to be one of the new ministers, she was going to be one of the new ministers, and Stephen Gagley uh, provided uh, some advice on that question. The advice has been, is public, um, seems to have been made at the request of the Governor-General uh, uh, as to uh, how that uh, happened inside the government. Um, I don't know and um, I don't know whether Stephen can say anything about that or not. Um, finally, um, you'll see that um, in New South Wales, um, both the Attorney-General and the Solicitor-General uh, are required to express the opinion prior to legislation receiving the governor's assent, that there's no objection to the governor giving that assent. Um, in some other jurisdictions, at least, Victoria is an example, uh, that certification is done by the Attorney General alone. Um, so I'm not sure that all of that doesn't raise more questions um, than it answers in relation to um, the role of the, the Solicitor General in relation to uh, Vice Regal representatives, um, but it's certainly an intriguing um, subject and um, uh, it, 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 it may be that um, it is worth thinking about uh, how this operates in practice. A lot will depend perhaps on the personalities of the relevant Attorney General, Premier, Solicitor General, Governor, but um, it, it seems to me on the available material that, um, that the uh, principles that might govern this role haven't been uh, clearly identified and uh, so um, that that's something that uh, uh, might happen in the future but again given the um, confidential nature of this role it's um, also something that's uh, likely to happen if at all uh, very slowly. For more information visit bond.edu.au forward slash iTunes U.